It is my pleasure to introduce you to the president of the George Washington University, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Thank you, Megan. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the George Washington University and the historic Lisner Auditorium for today's opening plenary session of the 2010 GreenGov Symposium. Our core mission at George Washington is to educate citizen leaders for the world. We enjoy the advantage of being able to engage the world from this nation's capital, and one of the ways we do that is by convening discussions of the most important issues of our time. And we benefit tremendously from the ability to do so in partnership with our neighbors. Today we are honored to have as our co-host the White House Council on Environmental Quality. In partnership with the Council, we are responding to President Obama's charge to the federal government to lead by example in our national quest for a clean economy, clean energy economy, and a sustainable future. We recognize that given its scale and its resources, the government has a unique capacity to adopt innovations that institutions like ours will be able to emulate and that when transferred to industry, will not only improve the environment, but strengthen America's economic competitiveness. So once again, in partnership with the Council on Environmental Quality, we have brought together experts and practitioners from government, academia, industry, and the nonprofit sector in the hope and expectation that their insights and experience will help shape and inspire a national response to the President's call. We are grateful for the generous support of the organizations that are making this symposium possible, including platinum level sponsors, Noblis and the Eaton Corporation. On a smaller scale, of course, than the federal government, George Washington, like many institutions of higher learning, has strongly embraced sustainability, both as an academic subject and a principle guiding all our operations. In that effort, we have benefited from the growing presence of sustainability experts on our faculty. Equally important, we have been spurred on by the passionate engagement of our students. We have developed more than a dozen degree and certificate programs in sustainability in fields ranging from urban planning and landscape design to environmental law, from renewable energy to water resources engineering and environmental health. We also want to make sure that we practice what we teach. We were the first university in the nation's capital to sign the American College and University President's climate commitment to achieve carbon neutrality. Last fall, we opened our first building with LEED Gold certification and the first university building in the District of Columbia to achieve that standard, South Hall on the Foggy Bottom campus. This fall, we opened a second building that is targeted for gold certification, West Hall on our Mount Vernon campus on Foxhall Road. And to ensure that best practices and sustainability will increasingly permeate our operations, we launched a $2 million green campus fund to help seed energy and water saving projects on all our campuses. To give you a flavor of what sustainability means to our university community, we prepared a short video, which I hope you'll enjoy. It will show you more effectively than I can tell you why we are so pleased and honored to co-host this important symposium. Thank you. When I came to GW, I got really involved right away with Green GW because I really am passionate about becoming more sustainable and environmentally friendly. I think I really have always had 
a draw to public service. I think that's one main reason why I actually chose George Washington University to come to. One of the real advantages of being here in Washington, D.C. is to do site visits and student projects with a full range of sustainable business, government, and nonprofit organizations. GW does a really good job of integrating itself into D.C. So for example, with Green GW, we did a lot of educational stuff for our students about how to live green in a residence hall, uh, how to recycle on GW campus property. I'm uh, one of the advisors of uh, a group called GW Net Impact, and this is a group of business school students who are very interested in social and environmental issues. GW Net Impact uh, recently uh, initiated the idea that a green roof would have multiple environmental and even some social benefits here on campus. Essentially, I work with businesses, governments, and NGOs uh, to promote partnerships that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Going to GW was absolutely central to me being in the position that I'm in today. I think the combination of being able to take classes that were really engaging and interesting with the ability to get really involved in something that I'm passionate about. When those two ideas converged, I got this perfect little package of this is what I want to do. It makes me feel truly wonderful to be able to give back and it feels fantastic to know that the work I do and I care about has had an impact on other people's lives. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Moore, the Federal Environmental Executive. Good morning, everybody. I am incredibly grateful, incredibly grateful to be here with you all today. Um, many of you who I have the pleasure of working with every day, uh, many new colleagues. I'm grateful for our wonderful hosts, the George Washington University, and I'm also grateful for the leadership of Nancy Sutley, the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, who I have the pleasure of introducing you today. Nancy is President Obama's chief environmental advisor, and under her leadership, CEQ has convened the development of a national oceans policy, the America's Great Outdoors Initiative, and of course, the GreenGov program, among many other initiatives we're here to talk about today. Uh, Nancy herself knows this work extremely well and is very passionate about it. Uh, after serving at EPA beginning in the Clinton administration, uh, she went on to lead the city of Los Angeles' sustainability efforts as deputy mayor. So please join me in welcoming Chair Nancy Sutley. Good morning, and thank you all for being here. It's really great. Uh, I, I actually can't see any of you. Oh, there you are. Um, so, good morning, and welcome to the Green Gov Symposium, and we're very thrilled to have you here. Um, but before I, I start my um, a very interesting speech, I thought I would ask you a few questions, because we're, we're trying to do some audience surveys. So, how many of you are federal government employees? Oh, that's a lot of you. Great. And how many of you are from the D.C. metro area? All right, and, and how many of you are from outside DC? Oh, excellent. And uh, how many of you read every word of Executive Order 13514? Oh, that's a lot of you. How many of you have never heard of Executive Order 13514? Oh, good, not too many, because I was going to tell you we're at the wrong conference. <laughs> um, well, but we're just very thrilled uh, to, to welcome you here to GreenGov. I think we're going to have a great few days, and I wanted to start by just uh, extending a couple of thanks first to our, our terrific hosts here at George Washington University, to President Knapp and all the staff here has done just a great job of uh, helping us pull this all together and giving us uh, uh, this great venue to, to start out this morning. Um, and also a, a big thank you to Michelle Moore, uh, the federal environmental executive who you just heard from. Uh, part of the CEQ team and her team. They've done uh, just a tremendous amount of hard work uh, to create a great program 
for, the, for this week, and also to really um, pull, I think, uh, a real terrific program together for sustainability in the federal government. So it's really great to see all of you here and to have such broad participation uh, from inside the government, outside the government, from inside Washington and outside Washington, and I think it shows how important and how invested we are all in the sustainable future for the federal government and for all Americans. And it was just, um, it's a year ago today that President Obama signed Executive Order 13514 to ask the federal government uh, to look at itself and to push, leverage our assets, our purchasing power, our large and dedicated workforce to help build the clean energy economy of the future, to cut pollution um, that is hurting our planet, and to save taxpayers money in the process. And this administration has really taken um, unprecedented action to help to support that, the growth of the 21st century clean energy economy for the United States, from the largest ever investment in basic research to financial support for innovative green businesses uh, to aggressive new uh, national fuel economy standards, including um, and I know for many of your agencies, uh, very helpful, a historic $90 billion investment in clean energy through the Recovery Act that's doubled our capacity to generate renewable energy in this country. Now, the, this, the executive order acknowledges that in our day-to-day -day operations alone, the federal government has tremendous power to influence the direction of this country towards a 21st century sustainable future. And, but we also have an obligation to lead by example. So one of the first things we did uh, after the president signed the executive order was to ask the federal community to share their ideas for meeting the president's goals uh, through the Green Gov Challenge and our 65,000 votes. The Green Gov Challenge uh, gave us an impressive range of ideas from very simple things that we could do to help the, make the federal government more sustainable to the very creative. And one that rose to the top in terms of votes was getting federal agencies to encourage telework. Another was to update our IT systems to turn off federal computers at night. A lot of people wanted to make sure when they drive by their office building at night they don't see uh, lights, so they see them turned off, and that we're not wasting energy and money. And others suggested getting styrofoam cups and cartons out of their building cafeterias. We got some uh, more offbeat ideas, a little more unusual ideas that are working well. One of my favorites, um, using goats to gobble weeds and excess grass at a facility in Southern California, which is cleaner and cheaper than lawnmowers, and they're so much cuter. Well, these are good and achievable ideas, and there's a, there's a theme that made a big impression on all of us. Regardless of uh, whether your job is every day uh, to worry about sustainability in your agency or in your company, um, the federal community at large cares about sustainability. They care about how green their workplace is. It, it affects uh, everybody's work, everyday work experience, and, and how we feel about the work we do. So whether your job is focused on energy security or public lands or, or something else, you connect with that mission. So we're now a year um, into, this, into the challenge that the president laid out for us in the executive order, and I think we've got some very good work to show for it. The executive order set targets for agencies, including goals for energy efficiency, reducing greenhouse gas pollution, conserving water, and promoting sustainable communities. And last month, after a lot of hard work, uh, 56 agencies released their sustainability plans. These outline the strategies agencies will use to meet these goals. Um, and this was you know, large agencies, uh, small agencies, and everything in between, and really some great ideas uh, and some great commitments on sustainability actions that most importantly align with the individual missions and responsibilities of those agencies. So, for example, at the Department of Defense, the Air Force plans to certify all of its aircraft 
to operate with a 50% alternative fuel blend by next year. At the Department of Labor, they're uh, in integrating sustainability into their core operations and making sure that all their construction and renovation pro projects use recycled and environmentally friendly products. These actions that we've committed to across the federal government will have real and tangible benefits for our economy and for our environment. The federal government is the single largest energy consumer in the United States, racking up a $25 billion electricity and fuel bill in 2008. Meeting just one of our goals, for example, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 28%, will cut federal energy use by the equivalent of 205 million barrels of oil and avoid between eight and $11 billion in energy costs over the next decade. And as you can see by the breadth of participation um, in this symposium, agencies across the federal government are excited and proud of what they're doing and, and what they intend to do to live up to the promise of GreenGov. And we know the federal government isn't the only one to discover the value of sustainability. It's been a topic of discussion in boardrooms and in state houses and city halls uh, across the country and for a long time. And I know this firsthand, having served in both state government and local government in California, where we spent a lot of time participating in that conversation, thinking about the things that we could do to make our communities uh, greener and more sustainable. The many businesses and nonprofit organizations, state and local governments and colleges and universities that have been leaders in this area have experience, expertise, and innovative ideas to share with us. And the scale of the federal government means, means that we can have a, an enormous impact on the areas they care about too. Sustainable building is one example, considering that the federal government owns or operates half a million buildings throughout the country, and, and literally in every corner of our nation. The federal government's scale also makes uh, us a powerful test market for new technologies and ideas that come from the private sector. And it's our honor and our responsibility to use this influence in a way that benefits all Americans supports a job-producing clean energy economy, protects our environment, and helps contribute to the health and the prosperities of, prosperity of the communities in which we operate. And I know that's why you are all here today. This symposium uh, is about turning a vision into practice and engaging minds and experiences from inside and outside the federal community to do this in a way that fills, fulfills that enormous pro promise. Now, when the president uh, signed the executive order, order um, actually before he, he signed it, I met with him and, and the rest of the Green Cabinet to discuss the goals and, and targets he was setting for the federal government and the type of impact that they would have. And he asked me whether we were doing enough. Well, let's use this symposium to answer that question. Over the next three days, you'll have the chance to teach and learn and to form partnerships and uh, spark ideas that have the power to catalyze widespread action. So we ask you as you, you embark on these three, three days to think about things like, will you go further? Uh, will you multiply this work when you get home? How many of you will be inspired to create green teams in your office? How many more green govs will you form in states and cities and, and counties across America. You know, the president has asked us to lead and I have no doubt that we'll succeed. And the president has also included his own home and office in this challenge. Uh, when, when he signed the executive order, we were in the Oval Office and he asked me what were we doing uh, about sustainability here at the White House. And he wanted to make sure that we were doing our part to lead by example too. So let me tell you a few of the things that are going on at the White House complex, just a few blocks from here. Uh, we've been replacing styrofoam cups and cafeteria items with com compostable ones, uh, composting food waste, and working towards LEED certification for the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. As many of you know, um, First Lady Michelle Obama has planted a vegetable garden on the White House lawn 
uh, that's helped inspire Americans across the country to do the same in their own uh, backyards and in their communities. And when the president asks you what, are you, what are we doing, you have to take it seriously. So we've been working on some other important steps as well. And the number one question we get when we talk about greening the White House is whether we're going to put solar panels on the roof. So in keeping with our commitment uh, to lead by example, we have an important announcement to make, and so I'd like to uh, invite to join me on the stage um, our, our partner in this and our friend and colleague, uh, Energy Secretary Steve Chu. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nancy. Before I begin my talk, as Nancy said, I want to make a very exciting announcement. As you know, President Obama has a strong commitment to American leadership in solar technologies and the jobs they create. Through the Recovery Act, we're supporting deployment of today's solar technologies, and we're on track to double our renewable energy generation capacity by 2012. We're also investing next generation solar power through R&D programs at the Department of Energy. But today, we're taking another important step as we move towards a clean energy economy, the White House will lead by example. I'm pleased to announce that by, by the end of this spring, there will be solar panels that convert sunlight into electricity and a solar hot water heater on the roof of the White House. It's been a long time since we've had them up there. <laughs> These two solar installations will be part of the Department of Energy demonstration project. The project will show that American solar technology is available, reliable, and ready to install in homes throughout the country. Around the world, the White House is a symbol of freedom and democracy. It should also be a symbol, a symbol of America's commitment to a clean energy future. And with that, I'd like to begin my talk. Thank you, Nancy. We need someone's password. <laughs> Normally, I'm completely trusted. <laughs> now, my, my computer uh, was running out of juice. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to talk about the energy, uh, an opportunity, and it's rarely framed as an opportunity, but it is really an energy opportunity. But first, I want to tell you why we're doing it, in part. This is the temperature record of the world average of land and ocean between 1880 and 2009. It actually goes back to 1850. And during this time, you see that the temperature goes up and down. It has little bumps and wiggles we don't fully understand. Sometimes the temperature plateaus. Sometimes it actually decreases. But the overall trend is that it's increasing. Um, much was said over the last few years, uh, if you look at that curve in 2005, 6, 7, that it was plateauing, it was maybe even dipping, uh, and therefore it was branded a climate hoax. Um, but you can pick and choose one or two years, but the overall thing I want to emphasize is over the last 150 years, 160 years, the trend is unmistakable and it's easy to understand why. The amount of energy hitting the earth in all forms, sunlight, infrared heat, ions from sunspots, radio waves, been measured by satellite over the last 35 years, and apart from 11-year solar cycle, it's been constant. The increase in greenhouse gases has prevented heat from escaping, so energy coming in the same, energy leaving less. So guess what? Over the long period of time, the earth warms up. I think it's something you all understand. If you eat the same amount of food but exercise less, guess what? Over a long period of time, you will gain weight. How you will gain that weight in one day, two day intervals, we don't know, but over a two year, 10 year interval, you do know something. So that's what we face. Now, it just so happens 2010 may be the hottest or second hottest year in record. So it has been a plateau. Um, but if we don't do something about it, that temperature will increase. What are the effects of this temperature increase? Well, those have been measured. In the past 2,000 years, it's estimated that the 
average height of the sea relative to land masses, and you know, the continents move around and they go up and down a little bit, but the average height has been fairly constant between 0 and 0 0.2 millimeters per year. And ever since measurements were being made, that has been accelerating. Right now it's 3 millimeters a year, five times greater than it was when direct measurements were being made. And the question is, why is the sea level rising? Well, it's been posited that the sea level is rising because ice on land, for example, in Greenland and, and the glaciers all around the world, are melting and they're running into the ocean. But the question is, is that true? And we have actually made measurements, very precise measurements. This is uh, actually a cartoon of two photographs. Uh, they're satellites, very precise satellites that are orbiting the Earth. And as the satellites orbit the Earth, the distance between the satellites is measured to one millimeter. And if there's a bigger mass on the Earth, for example, this ice sheet in Greenland, that perturbs the orbit of those satellites, and you can actually measure the local variations in mass. And so what has been happening is that these satellites have been measuring the local variations of mass all over the world. As a, for instance, between the 2002 and 2009, these satellites are showing that the ice mass in Greenland is melting. The measurement is so precise that not only is it showing it's melting, but it's accelerating. Therefore, the trend is not a straight line, but it's actually a parabolic line going ever faster. And you can actually tell the difference between winter and summer. And um, now, if Greenland melts in its entirety, there's about two kilometers thick worth of glacier on Greenland, uh, the sea level will rise about seven meters worldwide. And so there's a lot of low-lying airports that just kind of go underwater. So this is what we're seeing. What are we also seeing? If you look in the recent past, between 1961 and 1979, this plots the number of days that are above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of the United States has less than 10 degrees above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, except a few spots in uh, Texas and California, uh, Arizona. What is projected by the end of this century is if we continue as business as usual on a high emission scenario, that the number of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit will be staggering. Uh, and as you see, in some areas of the uh, southern parts of the United States, we'll have over three months worth of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is something, and it's not going to be very good for the water supplies in these areas as well. So this is alarming, and climate scientists have been calling for more aggressive action. And others say, well, wait. I'm not convinced this is really true or that humans caused it. And uh, they're saying that taking action will hurt our economy. But I maintain that this is a completely false choice that we are in a race to develop clean energy technologies around the world, that countries around the world have noted that the climate's changing, that it's due to humans, and they're doing something about it. And that includes countries like China, which over about two years ago did an about face turn, if you will. And from the premier of China on down, they're saying climate change would be devastating to China and the rest of the world. China's use of coal is unsustainable. We're going to do something about it. And they are developing clean energy technologies in solar, in wind, in uh, nuclear, in electrical transmission and distribution, where their renewables are in the western part of China and they're porting that over to the eastern part of China. So they have the highest voltage AC and DC transmission lines in the world now and the most efficient. So this is what's happening. And so the question is, as these countries move aggressively into this space, to develop these new technologies. Well, we, which still has, the United States still has the greatest innovation machine in the United States, will we be a leader in this race or will we, or will we be importing technologies from abroad five and 10 years from today? So that's the choice we have. Just as one example, solar PV is a booming global industry. In the mid-1990s, the US had 40% of the market share the United States, in fact, my old stomping ground, Bell Laboratories, invented the silicon photocell. 
and yet now we have about 5% of the market share. And this is being played off not only in um, solar technologies, but in all these high technologies, energies of the future. So this brings us to the federal government. And we in the federal government and you can make an immediate difference. And as you heard from Nancy Sudley, the executive order 13514 uh, says that uh, there should be federal leadership in environmental energy and economic performance. And that's the president signing that order. Uh, the Department of Energy runs a federal energy management program and it should be a resource for the entire government on how to make cost-effective energy management investment practices routine. Sustainable buildings, renewable energy, you read the list here. One of the first things I did when I became Secretary of Energy is that we had a stalled uh, ESCOs, or energy savings performance contracts, and, um, and I said, well, this is not good. It had been stalled for uh, some I won't go into the reasons, but it was, everything was on hold, and I finally called up the general counsel's office and said, well, what can I do to undo this? And the person, uh, the, the uh, acting head of the general counsel of the Department of Energy said, well, there is one possibility. The Secretary of Energy can order a waiver for this bureaucratic uh, technicality, but I don't think he's inclined to do that. Uh, he was talking to me. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll discuss it with the Secretary of Energy. <laughs> and uh, and I, just, I said, well, let's find out. You have three days. You know, let's, are there any repercussions in this waiver that are unforeseen? If they're not, uh, I'll just order the waiver. And after three days, there, there was nothing, and we did it. And that's led to a billion dollars in projects 2009, 2010, which actually cost the federal government nothing. If you know about these federal contracts, Another company comes in and says, we will decrease your energy bill, we'll finance it. Uh, the savings from your energy bill, we'll share or get a lot of the cost of that. So that's how the company says, that's how we're gonna make our money. Uh, you pay us for saving energy and we make money, everybody's happy. Planet especially is happy. What are some of the other things we're doing? Well, if you look at where we spend our energy, uh, it turns out the buildings, residential and commercial buildings, consume about 40% of US energy. The way we build and design buildings, let's say a commercial building, is as follows. You decide what you want, you get some preliminary designs, then you go to detailed engineering designs, you build the building. As you're building the building, you find out, okay, we have to make changes here, there, and everywhere else. And uh, typically what happens is you get over budget and so you have what's called value engineering, you, you cut corners on, on the design of the building. Uh, and the first thing that usually goes is anything having to do with energy efficiency. We don't have to design buildings that way. Um, you can have a completely computer-aided design of a building and as an example, this is the way we build airplanes. Whenever you build an airplane today, a modern airplane, it's designed on the computer, the whole airplane is on the computer, you make any little change and the computer program will tell you what it will do to the performance of that airplane, what will do to the range, what will do to the speed, its fuel economy, everything. <clears throat> and so what we can do is go to this way of designing buildings. In the design tools, you can have embedded energy analysis and you can actually tell the structural engineers and the architects, don't do that, you should do this because by just modestly changing the ductwork, you can save enormous amounts of money and energy, things like that. So this is what we're doing and we're developing programs uh, to do that, but you can do much more. In the operation of the building, uh, before you actually turn the building over to its occupants, there's a thing called commissioning a building. That's when you actually turn the building on, the heating and ventilation systems, and you tune it up because it's not exactly right. Some rooms are too hot, some rooms are too cold. And so you tune it up, and this commissioning will actually save in energy cost per year about five or 10% of the energy of the building because you get rid of that Goldilocks problem where it's either too hot or too cold. Now, there's another way of doing that, and that way is let the intelligence of the building tune itself up in a continuous way. Right now, there's a lot of people in this auditorium. There's ventilation in the auditorium. As soon as you all leave, you don't need the ventilation. 
there are very, very inexpensive sort of dollar sensors that can actually tell when people are in the room because of the CO2 increase. So, and uh, we're doing this today in, in our airplanes and our automobiles and many, many systems where there are many computers that sense, for example, in a car, the oxygen, the air pressure, the temperature sensor, the position of the throttle, and it constantly tunes your engine up, puts in the right amount of fuel, adjusts the timing, it sometimes adjusts the timing of the valves. So the buildings can be automatically tuned. You no longer take your car into the shop to get it tuned. You take it into the shop and the car's computers talk to the shop's computers and the mechanic bills you. Um, <laughs> so computer design, aided design and operation can lead to enhanced comfort, energy savings, and cost savings. And this is what it's about. We think that we can decrease the cost energy consumption buildings by a factor of four, 75 percent decrease in energy. Half of that won't cost anything more and the next half will pay for itself in less than 10 years. That's our goal. This is going to make money. This is not going to be uh, a building that's gilded. It will cost a lot more to run. It will cost less to run. And any investment you make will save money. So that's what we want to get across people's minds. Energy efficiency means you're saving money. Um, now we have uh, in the Department of Energy, NREL is one of our national laboratories for renewable energy, and they've just built a new research support facility. It's the world's largest net zero office building, and uh, DOE's Jeff Baker received a Service to America medal for leading the design construction of this building. We propose to go further on that. Uh, let me give you an option of a very low cost uh, thing that one can do. This is a building in Dallas, Texas, and its roof is white. Because its roof is white and not black, it doesn't absorb as much heat. And that sunlight energy is reflected back into space rather than heating up the buildings and using more air conditioning. And this is very important because, it, because it's visible light, there's less of a greenhouse effect, and so it just bounces back into space. Uh, now, many people think white roofs aren't beautiful. I personally think they're very beautiful. This is uh, a village in Santori, Greece, of lots of white buildings. But the point here is not only does it save in air conditioning costs, but since it reflects the energy directly back into space, it's as if, if we took all the urban roofs and pavements and made them lighter colored, reflecting either white for roofs or what are called cool colors or lighter pavements, not black tops. It's the, if we did this, it's the equivalent of eliminating carbon emissions from all of the world's automobiles for 11 years. So it's a uh, substantial change in the climate of the earth. And for this reason, we have been looking into white roofs. Between 2005 and 2010, 2.5 million square feet of roof replacements in our uh, DOE buildings, and we're estimating over the life of the roof, say 20 years, we're going to be saving $13 million. And because of this, on June 2010, I ordered that all Department of Energy facilities use cool roofs, either white roofs, or you can actually get infrared reflecting colors if, you, if, if, if they're a slanted roof and you want uh, some artistic uh, freedom. But to use cool roofs in all new construction replacements, exceptions would be allowed only when it can be proven that the cost savings would not be achieved. So if you prove that you will not save money, it's okay to put on a black roof, but otherwise the default is put on a cool roof. Data centers account now for 10 to 15 percent of all federally uh, facility energy use, and it's growing, and we are uh, introducing a lot of innovations, innovative cooling technologies, ways so, you know, typically if you don't really think about it, you put a computer in a room, you need, and suppose it uses a certain amount of electrical power, you'll need 50 percent more power to keep the room cool enough to operate the computer. Now the best rooms that are designed this way, you only need 10 percent more or even less. And so we're getting towards that goal. The computers themselves uh, can be virtualized in the sense Right now, many businesses or federal or agencies have one set of computers for human resources, another set of computers for finance, another set of computers for procurement, and everything else. 
but with today's software, you can actually share all these things on one single computer, maintain the privacy, the firewalls that prevent data from being moved around. And so we're doing those things as well. So the, the security of these systems is not compromised, but one computer can serve all. And so that the average duty cycle, you know, if you have one computer for procurement, it may be used only 30, 20 percent of the time. And so you can use the single computer more often. Many, many instances of this. We're also trying to change energy habits, not only in ways that are affected by the management of these buildings, but we also say, look to your own home. 75% of the electricity in home electronics and appliances are used when the things are off or on standby. For example, you have computers at home or your kids have computers at home. Um, you can use a power strip. You plug all the computer stuff into the power strip, the screen, the speakers, the printer, everything. And when you turn off your computer, just turn off a single switch on the power strip. Um, this means that you're not constantly having those little red lights on, on and slowly um, sipping electricity. Um, we are starting to submeter uh, Department of Energy. We have a big building and we want a submeter. The reason we want a submeter is we want a little contest of this floor or that wing of the building will save more energy than the next wing. And you know, pizza parties and all those other things. Um, the firm of Zoy and Harris, this is Kathy Zoy of uh, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy and Scott Harris, General Counsel, have teamed up together. For the first de time in the department's history, um, we not only set appliance standards, efficiency standards, uh, we work with the EPA for Energy Star, that's a volunteer program, but we also set mandatory standards. And, um, we set these mandatory standards for decades, but we didn't enforce one of them. Weird, huh? Uh, uh, when um, Scott Harris came in as general counsel, we sat down together and, and said, well, why aren't we enforcing them? We asked our people and said, well, our, rule, our job is to, to make the standards, not to enforce them. Well, who enforces the standard? Well, nobody. So, um, um, we are enforcing the standards, and something remarkable happened. We had 45 lawyers in the Department of Energy who volunteered to Moonlight to help enforce the standards, as well as doing their regular job. Amazing when you can get lawyers to volunteer their time. Anyway, so the firm of Zoya and Harris is off to the races. Um, we want to make energy savings and money savings a social norm. And so the question is, you can ask yourself, what can I do to save energy? And let me give you one simple example. You have computers at home. Um, you can put your computer on an energy saving diet, just in case you don't know where that is. If you open up the control panel, there's a thing called power options in that control panel down there. Uh, let me see if I can, this one right here. And you click on it. And if you click on it, you can find out what are the power options when the computer's plugged in, or if it's a laptop, what are the power options when it runs on batteries. And so what I suggest is uh, you can put on a system standby after 15 minutes. What system standby? It doesn't shut the computer down. Shutting down Windows, for example, takes three or four minutes and, you know, it hangs up 50% of the time. That's something you don't want to do. <laughs> Hibernation you know, takes one minute. That's really a pain. However, if it goes in system standby, it takes a few seconds. And it takes a few seconds for it to come up. And yet it saves 95% uh, of the energy. So you can put it on system standby and you come back and just push a button and then off it goes again. It's only saving seconds, but much power. And uh, you know, you can, uh, power schemes up here, you can actually label the power scheme. Uh, power source stop nards, you can put in your custom one and so you can label uh, and you should label these power schemes as saving the world. <laughs> you can design your own power scheme. So let me summarize. Science is predicting that we're altering the destiny of the earth. We are changing, humans are changing the climate, uh, but we can do something about it. And the question is, are, will we, are we willing to make investments that will secure our economic future? in this competitive world, racing towards the second industrial revolution. 
And in doing so, we will also be protecting the environment for our children and our grandchildren. And um, I want to close with a picture. Um, it was a picture taken by Voyager 1. Voyager 1 uh, explored the planets, starting with Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus. Uh, and in 1990, as Voyager 1 was leaving the solar system, Carl Sagan, the astrophysicist at Cornell, convinced the NASA engineers to turn the cameras backward for last pictures of our solar system before Voyager went into deep space. And so they said, OK, we'll do this. And they took a picture of Earth from the distance of Pluto, and here you see circled a very pale blue dot of light. And Carl Sagan wrote very movingly about this photograph. And so I'll read you part of that quote. He said, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Our planet is a lonely speck. In all of this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. Like it or not, the earth is where we make our stand. So I'll close with an ancient Native American saying, treat the earth well. It was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. And we cannot break this sacred trust. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Chu, for those inspiring words. Um, uh, as you know, our, our energy secretary is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, but we know him as the guy who carries his own PowerPoint and appreciate all of that. Thank you. And it's my very uh, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, from his uh, first days uh, with the administration and uh, for every day since, uh, Secretary Tom Vilsack has advocated passionately for America's rural communities and the economic opportunities that clean energy presents for them. He also oversees a department that is a leader in federal sustainability. The Department of Agriculture has established more than 200 people's gardens across the country that are not only greening federal campuses but contributing tens of thousands of pounds of food to community soup kitchens and food pantries. So uh, it is now my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, to all of you Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, boy, folks, I hope you give me a break after Steve Chu. <laughs> I've got no PowerPoint. I, I can't tell you anything about the Earth, uh, the solar system. Um, I am really challenged today. Uh, let me first of all acknowledge uh, Nancy Sutley and her leadership. Uh, we are fortunate in the Obama administration to have a uh, chance to work with each other in a collaborative way. And Nancy has, uh, as you know, the chair of the Council on Environmental uh, Quality. And in that context, she's obviously uh, focused on our Green Gov initiative, but she's also heavily involved in the Great American Outdoors. Uh, and this is an opportunity for us to reconnect people with the Great Outdoors. Uh, particularly the young people of this country. Uh, we're dealing with a, a serious challenge, uh, not only in terms of our environment, but also in terms of young people and, and an obesity challenge that the First Lady is focused on. And Nancy has provided great leadership to all of us uh, in, that, in that effort. And she's also working with the Department of Agriculture and a number of other departments on, a, on, an, on an issue that's important to Americans, and that's our waterways, our major waterways, the Great Lakes, the Mississippi River, the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, trying to reclaim those and trying to live up to the standard that Steve Chu just set for all of us to make sure that uh, when our children 
uh, are given the opportunity to uh, partake and enjoy those great natural resources that they're in better shape uh, than when we receive them. So it's uh, very uh, appropriate that Nancy is uh, uh, chairing this effort. Certainly want to acknowledge uh, the George Washington University and the opportunity to be on this great campus. Uh, and I want to thank all of you uh, for taking the time from your busy schedules to be engaged in this very important effort. I want to put this in a slightly different context. Um, I think you're going to hear a lot about the environment. You're going to hear a lot about sustainability. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about uh, the important uh, steps that federal government is taking. But I think you need to understand what is happening in this country, and that is that we are in the process, in my view, of redefining uh, the American experience and redefining the American economy. Uh, if you think about it, the President has uh, laid out a very simple plan for getting our country back on track. Uh, first of all, it involves uh, saving first and consuming wisely. And so you'll hear a lot of conversation in, in the halls of, of the Congress and in the White House about deficit reduction and conservation of, of resources and assets. Uh, it's about innovating, allowing us to create and make more things. It's the thing that America does best. We innovate, then we create new things. And then finally, it's about exporting what we make and what we know to the rest of the world, creating economic opportunity and growth. Uh, here in this country. And when you think about the Green Gov initiative, it fits very nicely into that new paradigm for uh, the American economy. Uh, you all are involved and interested in conserving energy and, in essence, saving. Uh, you're encouraging us to consume that energy that we need and must use wisely. Uh, you're suggesting that there are innovative solutions and creative ways to, to use energy uh, more appropriately in a more sustainable way, so you're innovating to create and make. And the purpose of this symposium, I, I suspect, is in part to figure out what the good practices are and then to export them out across the countryside. So you are very much involved as part of an effort to sort of redefine uh, the American experience and the American economy, in addition to the important work that we're doing in terms of conserving natural resources and creating a more sustainable ethic in this country. And your USDA wants to be part of that effort. Uh, first and foremost, we, we obviously want to look at how we can conserve our natural resources and conserve our energy use at USDA. And so we have set very significant targets in terms of reducing water uh, usage at USDA and uh, reducing energy use and as well as reducing our carbon footprint. And I'm pleased to say that in the first year or so of this effort, we're well beyond where we thought we would be. Uh, we've reduced our energy intensity by 22 percent in the last year. Uh, we now uh, procure 5% of our energy from renewable sources, and that will continue to grow. We've seen a 21% uh, reduction in uh, the use of water at USDA. Uh, within the headquarters here in Washington, D.C., we've redirected 60% of our waste, uh, and we're formulating a strategy to substantially reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, now, that's part of the, what you would expect uh, an agency to focus on, but we're going a little bit beyond that. Uh, we see that there's an opportunity for us at USDA to promote, not just in the USDA, but across the entire government, uh, the need for us to focus on bio-based product purchasing. And so we have a bio-preferred program, and we're charged with the responsibility of encouraging folks to look for ways in which to utilize uh, bio-preferred uh, products. Today we've sanctioned essentially 4,500 different individual items that can be purchased uh, by the federal government agencies that are uh, bio-based. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to really uh, significantly expand uh, bio-based uh, production and services, and we're proud of that. But we want to go beyond government, and so we are working on uh, the final rule that will allow us to voluntarily label items so that the consuming public, the entire United States uh, consuming public, will have the opportunity to do what we are currently trying to do in the federal government, uh, which is to focus on uh, a bio-based uh, and bio-preferred uh, purchasing program. Nancy referred to the People's Garden. Uh, we're really excited about that. Uh, I must say that uh, there's a garden at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue that gets a little more play than ours. Um, but we now have 554 People's Gardens in all 50 states, uh, one territory and three foreign countries. It was a challenge to uh, USDA uh, to begin establishing uh, these people's gardens as a way of, uh, of reconnecting people with their food supply and having a greater awareness. And we're seeing this expand into schools as well. And we're looking at sustainable ways to produce these gardens. Uh, I was recently in 
my home state uh, in a, a USDA facility where they were showcasing the EnviroSock. Uh, this was a, a mesh material made from recycled uh, material that was filled with composting and essentially allows anyone to establish a garden anywhere. You could establish it on a concrete driveway. You could establish it on top of a roof. You didn't necessarily need a, a lot of soil. They were growing strawberries. They were growing uh, tomatoes out of these Enviro socks. Uh, it was a very innovative and creative way. It's uh, also very uh, easy to maintain the garden. And we're seeing a, a lot of innovative and creative strategies in terms of these gardens. And I'm proud to say that we've produced over 80,000 pounds of produce um, from these gardens uh, that were donated to food banks, uh, soup kitchens, uh, and a variety of charitable uh, efforts. Uh, it's a way for us to begin the process of reconnecting people with their food supply. Unfortunately, today, so many people think their food comes from a grocery store. And they fail to recognize uh, the difficulties uh, that we have uh, in raising food, uh, the risks and challenges in raising food in a sustainable way. Uh, we Americans, I think, sometimes take for granted uh, the extraordinary abundance that we have in this country. And we often don't take time to thank a farmer and rancher uh, for what they do for us and for what they do for our families. Few people in America appreciate the fact that each of us has a little more flexibility in our paycheck, uh, in part because of uh, the way in which we are able to produce an abundance in this country. Most people around the world spend somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of their paycheck uh, for food. In America, it's somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Uh, so I would ask all of you to reflect for just a moment on what you do with that additional 10 to 15 percent of your paycheck that isn't going to food that you have greater discretion. Are you uh, driving a nicer car? Are you perhaps living in a nicer home? Are you installing uh, new environmentally friendly appliances? Are you taking a vacation? Are you putting money aside for college for children? Are you perhaps uh, looking at a nest egg for retirement that's a little better than it would otherwise be? And when was the last time you thought of or thanked a farmer for that? So it is important for us to be reconnected with our food supply and understand where it comes from. In large part, we're also doing this in terms of our program called Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food, in which we're trying to reduce, in part, the carbon footprint of the food that we do consume, encouraging more local production to be linked to local consumers, uh, working with schools, uh, hospitals, institutional purchasers, so they have a full understanding of precisely what's grown and raised in their area, so they don't necessarily have to ship processed food a, a thousand miles with a very large uh, carbon footprint. This is all part of our effort uh, to become more sustainable. We're also working very hard in another area of our, of our uh, service uh, responsibilities, and that's in the conservation and forestry area. Very proud of the new forest planning process that we've put in place. We're focusing our attention on our national forests, 193 million acres of grasslands and forested areas in this country, recognizing the important role that they play in water conservation and preservation. Uh, understanding that if we can do a better job of restoring our forests and making them more resilient to climate change, we will also do a much better job of retaining that water and conserving it. 85% uh, of the drinking water of this country is impacted and affected by what happens on forested lands and private working lands. So part of USDA's uh, mission is to make sure that we use our conservation resources effectively and wisely and that we uh, maintain our forests in a way that maximizes water restoration. We also understand and appreciate that there's a connection between what we do on those working lands and some of these major water bodies I talked about earlier. We have a massive effort underway in the Chesapeake Bay to reclaim it and the upper Mississippi River to avoid uh, some of the problems in uh, the Delta, uh, working in the Great Lakes uh, to ensure that they are uh, of prime quality and also working in the California Delta to make sure that we do a good job of preserving very scarce water resources in that area. And finally, we're working on uh, a substantial effort to expand dramatically uh, the use of biofuels uh, in this country and to do it in a sustainable way, recognizing and understanding that in order for this industry to take hold, it has to be located in all parts of the country and has to use different uh, and, and, and uh, environmentally friendly feedstocks. And so we're doing a substantial amount of research uh, on, on, on sugarcane, on a woody biomass, on uh, perennial grasses and a way to expand dramatically the feedstocks that are available to produce these biofuels 
uh, which in turn will help us reduce uh, significantly our reliance on, on oil, and foreign oil in particular. When we reach the threshold of 36 billion gallons of renewable fuel from these uh, new feedstocks uh, and from more efficient use of uh, uh, existing corn-based ethanol, we will essentially create uh, somewhere between eight and 900,000 jobs in rural communities. We'll see a capital investment of about $95 billion in rural communities. Uh, and we will also no longer have to import 350 million barrels of oil. Uh, it is a tremendous opportunity for us to help reshape uh, the urban, uh, I mean the rural areas of this country. And if I can, when we talk about sustainability and we talk about it in the context of the environment, I think it is also important to understand the necessity for us to have strong rural communities in order to avoid the, the creep that's taking place in our urban centers uh, as we concrete over some of our prime land. Sustainability is about making sure that all parts of the country are healthy. We all have a stake in the survival of rural America. It isn't just the source of our food and a lot of our water and increasing percentage of our energy. It is also the source of our value system. And that's one of the things we're talking about here today, is the preservation of a value system. Uh, I often tell audiences that I speak to about the fact that 16% of the country's population live in small towns and rural areas and farms and ranches across the country but 40% of the people who serve us in uniform, 40% of those young people who are over in Afghanistan and Iraq today putting themselves and their lives on the line, separating themselves and their family, their community from safety and security, 40% of those young people come from rural America. And some might say the reason for that is because there isn't as much opportunity in those areas and they see the military as, as, as an opportunity to progress. That may be part of it, but I think it is really about the value system of this country that is deeply rooted in rural America. If you think about the founder of this country and if you think about uh, those who were uh, responsible for starting this country, most of them were farmers, many of them had rural roots. And they understood something about nature, which is that you can't keep taking from it. You have to continually uh, nurture it. You have to continually replenish it. That value system is taught to young people when they grow up in these small towns and on these farms and ranches that it's What's true of the land is also true of a country. You can't keep taking from it, you have to give something back to it. And so service is something that is expected. It's part of their responsibility. So as we see declining populations in rural America, as we see shifting demographics to urban centers, as we see development taking millions of acres of prime farmland in forested area, compromising our capacity over time to sustain our environment, it is also an impact on our value system. And that's why we at USDA are very focused on trying to create new opportunities in rural America based on a sustainable agenda. Let me finish by just simply uh, uh, quoting uh, uh, Robert Kennedy, who was responsible in part, at least uh, for me personally, getting involved in politics. Uh, as I was growing up as a young person, uh, he was running for president in 1968, and he often quoted George Bernard Shaw who said that some people look at things as they are and say, why? And others dream of things that never were and say, why not? And I think the people in this auditorium today are folks who often say to themselves, why not? But why not a, a government that basically begins to convert itself from one that is uh, not so responsible and one that is not thinking about saving and conserving uh, to one that is? And why not a government that models for the rest of the country the need to innovate so we can create and make. And why not be able to talk to our friends and neighbors about these new ideas and export them out so that we have a growing and vibrant uh, commitment to the environment and to stewardship and sustainability. And why not a country that has capacity and the, the opportunity to change itself, to reinvent itself as it has on frequent occasions, uh, showing the rest of the world the way. Why not an America that leads in this area? Uh, why not a, an America that understands that all parts of it, the country are important to it? And why not an America that understands sustainable agriculture is critically important, not just to those folks who farm and ranch, but to every single one of us? I hope that as you continue this three-day uh, effort, that you continually challenge uh, and ask, why not? Thank you very much.
Thank you, Secretary Vilsack, for those uh, very inspiring words. And it's uh, now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Janine Benyus. Uh, she's a prominent for her work in biomimicry, a field that studies nature's processes and emulates natural models to create sustainable solutions. She's the co-founder of the Biomimicry Guild, which helps designers learn from and emulate nature to solve design changes, uh, design challenges sustainably. And she's also president of the Biomimicry Institute, a nonprofit organization uh, that advocates incorporating biomimicry into global culture. And on top of that, she's uh, managed to find time to author six books. Um, so we're very excited to have her here today and glad that she could find the time to be with us. Um, so let me introduce uh, Janine Benyus. Thank you. Good morning. I am so thrilled to be here. Um, this, um, this group is doing something, I think, that uh, is not being done anywhere else in the world. This is the largest single entity, if you think about all 1.8 million federal employees, the largest single entity that has decided to take the ne next phase in sustainability, signing up for a deeper and more systemic approach to sustainability, going beyond just energy to water and chemistry and food and transport, looking at sustainability as an entire system. Um, I think that if I wasn't here speaking, I would actually want to be in the audience witnessing this. Um, because I, I've been watching the sustainability movement for a long time. And I do think that we're at an inflection point. And I think when you have something you know, as large an entity as you making this commitment, I think you'll look back on this conference and you'll say that you you came here to learn to comply with an executive order. But you wound up seeing the future instead. Um, thank you. Is that, let's wait till this gets up. Because I want to show you the future that I look at every day. <clears throat> Well, maybe not. I'll tell you about it instead. Um, I live in western Montana. And I live um, on the edge of the largest contiguous wilderness in the lower 48, which makes me a very, very fortunate person. Um, but when I, and, and I'm going to talk to you today about something called biomimicry, which is looking at systems like that and the organisms within systems like that to come up with uh, design challenges of our own, um, being informed by those that have evolved for 3.8 billion years. But when I look at those, um, can we get that up, please? Maybe, I don't know. There, I hear a lot of running around, so we'll just talk. Um, when I look at that wilderness area, literally outside my door, um, it gives me great solace. <laughs> because it says to me that we as a people in the United States are capable of grand, sweeping, bold, mature ideas. National parks, wildernesses, that I benefit so personally from and we all do collectively. Those are, the, those are our better angels as a country. And I think that we can do the same sort of thing around sustainability. For many, many, many years, sustainability has been a checklist. It's been a set of best practices um, that we check off, that we cobble together. 
But in order to really take hold, in order to really be the extreme makeover that we need in our culture, sustainability needs to go from being a checklist to being a culture. You know, it needs to become a lifestyle. Um, it needs to become the lens through which we look at everything, through which we make every decision. And the federal government has an interesting opportunity to make sustainability an experience that, um, that we, here I'll show you where I live. That's it there, it's pretty nice. Um, because the federal government is so distributed and there is a federal presence everywhere, I mean, even if you think about federal buildings and, you know, the courthouses and, and post offices and, there's a, and where I live, federal government is everywhere. And there's an opportunity for citizens in this country to walk into this green culture. Every great company has a great culture, Apple, 3M, the federal government. And the culture could be that of green. Not just a few, you know, not just a composting bin and a recycled paper, but everything, right? Every, every car that's being driven, the solar experiments going on on the roof, the landscaping being edible, um, every experience that you have from the moment you contact the federal government is one of the future. Um, green already happening. And I think that's what what you're about to see for the next three days are those, those sets of ideas that together create a system that begins to help us live on this planet sustainably. Let me, let me give you an example of what a system of sustainable practices can do. So this is, this is the view in the winter of that's the Selway Bitterroot, looking up the Big Creek Canyon up towards Ranger Peak. And then every year, around May, April, May, something amazing happens. Without EPA, <laughs> without executive orders, even without, sorry Nancy, CEQ, spring happens. That's a system of sustainable practices that work as a system. That's a culture, that's a green culture. Um, what I'd like to talk about today are some um, examples of ways that people in biomimicry have been looking to nature as, as mentor. Um, we look at nature, nature leads by example. Um, leading by example is not a platitude. In the natural world, it's actually a motive force. People like Lee Dugatkin and others talk about something called the imitation factor, in which evolution is actually impacted by organisms imitating each other. You know, the, the watching what a primate eats in your troop and then saying, well, that must be safe, I will imitate you and I will do that. A female choosing in, in lecking herds, for instance, choosing, or lecking birds, choosing uh, a mate based on what other females have already chosen, you know, the endorsement. That changes genes, it changes evolution. Imitation is a very powerful force. So you leading by example, as large as you are, think about that ripple. Think about the ripple on your five to 600,000 suppliers who are, many of whom are here today, I know. Um, because the federal government is about to become who we compare ourselves to. And in, even in, in social theory, imitation is important. If you think about social reference theory, it says that one of the fastest ways to change, to have personal transformation, is to change who it is you compare yourself to. So if you're um, a little boy growing up and you compare yourself to a gang leader, and then all of a sudden you read about Barack Obama, and you start comparing yourself to Barack Obama instead, that's huge. And I really think 
the rest of the country and the rest of the world will be watching. And steps like this will start us creating a green culture that the rest of the world compares themselves to. And hopefully that will increase rates of adaptation, as we would say in biology. Um, so let me show you uh, a few of the organisms that we compare ourselves to in biomimicry. This is also an example, biomimicry is a perfect example of why the federal government's leadership in research, high risk research, was so important and is so important. Um, I'm gonna show you some things that would have won the Golden Fleece Award when they were in the research phase. And now, I guarantee you they're, they're gonna be impacting your life as you choose sustainable technologies. Fish, schools, um, have incredibly energy efficient ways of moving. They actually, the, the, the fish will surf the vortex of the fish in head of it and the fish beside it. And a group of uh, uh, Cal Poly students said, you know, I wonder if we could put wind turbines, not horizontal wind turbines, which need lots and lots of land, but vertical wind turbines, if we could put them in arrangements like schools of fish, and whether they could actually surf the vortexes, actually speed up because of the vortexes created by the, by the wind turbine right in front of them. And indeed, they now are, are testing it. Um, their calculations show that there's perhaps 10 times more energy will be produced this way, and one hundredth of the land use for a flock of wind turbines. Um, kind of unusual from fish to turbines. But what we research is what we get. Here's another one. There's these, um, that's a tardigrade, that critter up top, and then the plant there is called the resurrection fern plant. Um, it's not actually a fern. But very, very common organisms, tardigrades. What happens to them is they dry out almost completely, but they don't die. And they go into a done state for up to 100 years. And then when you put water back on them, they come back to life. Same way with the resurrection fern. What's happening within their cells is that, that the very important biological material is being kind of shrink-wrapped in um, a sugar called trehalose. Now, a couple of companies have been, on, on the right are companies or labs that are working on this stuff. These, this is actually commercialized. A couple of companies are offering this as a way, a thermally stable storage device for vaccines. They've mimicked the trehalose. They're encapsulating in sort of tiny time capsules, vaccines, that they're able to put in an inert liquid. And basically, it'll stay in a glove compartment. Uh, of, a, of a Land Rover, right, for, for years and years. This is instead of refrigerating vaccines. 50% of all intended recipients for vaccines never receive them because there's a break in the cold chain. Biometrica is a company in San Diego. They're doing the same thing, but they're looking at biologicals like blood, uh, DNA samples, protein samples. Think about all the freezers that are at your locations um, with biologicals in them. Think about unplugging those freezers. Huge, huge energy savings from research on a very obscure but very handsome organism. <laughs> here's another handsome organism. Um, and here's a national laboratory. Government has been funding biomimetics um, for decades and decades and decades. Um, it's just now moving into industry, but it's been a government-funded thing. Um, moths are night flyers. They have anti-reflective devices on their eyes because they don't want eye shine, light reflecting from their eyes, to give them away to predators. Using the template from the moths, uh, folks at the National Laboratory and University of Florida are making anti-reflective coatings for solar cells. 30% of all sunlight coming into a solar cell is lost because of reflection. This device, easy to make, inexpensive, cuts it down to 2%. That's a 28% um, savings in light. Huge, huge, important. Um, here's another one for, for um, transport, for airplanes. 
Um, the, you've heard about Michael Phelps and the swimsuits that go 3% faster and the technological doping at the Olympics. The suits that they were wearing were mimicking the skin of sharks, which play with, with turbulence in a particular way to, to create a laminar flow for the shark to be able to move quickly through the water. Well, when now people are making um, films that they're able to put, um, and paints, in this case, this company down here is, using a, is, is creating a paint that when it dries, has the same sort of uh, structure that plays with turbulence in this way. They estimate that coating all the airplanes with this paint would save 4.5 million tons of fuel every year. Um, they're also contemplating what that would mean for coating ships. Um, so, 30 million species, maybe 100 million, some people say. I think it's closer to 100 million. 3.8 billion years of R&D, and years and years and years of government-funded research. The, bi the biology is done. Uh, the task is for us to take it and then actually try to emulate what we see. Um, there are, I'll give you a little update on the field. There are tens of thousands of people involved in this field. Um, the reason that they're, um, they're finding so many new ideas, there's been a study done by Julian Vincent at University of Bath, and he looked at the patent database, and he looked at um, the way humans have solved problems. He looked at a set of challenges, physical challenges, chemical challenges, and the way we've solved problems, and then the way the rest of the natural world has solved problems. And he figured there, there would be a lot of overlap. There was only about 10% overlap. That means that 90% of the time, people are surprised by these very elegant solutions that the rest of the natural world have come up with. You know, there's something about having to work for your energy <laughs> um, that makes you very frugal. Uh, what's happening now with biomimicry is it's moving into industry. These are some of the, um, as Nancy said, I wrote this book, Biomimicry, and, and then companies started to call, companies like this, asking for biologists to be at their design table. And so I created a company of biologists to be able to serve this, um, this need. And we go in and, and basically, if the problem is filtration, we talk about how nature filters. Um, questions like this, how does nature store energy? How does nature sequester CO2 or fix CO2? Um, and we do a big amoeba through zebra sweep um, of those uh, and look into the biological literature, find mechanisms, and then the engineers and designers and architects within these companies try to emulate it. I think storing energy, I sort of highlighted that one because I think it's one that would be a really good one for us to have a, a, a a biological charrette around storing energy right now. And I'm sure there are other global challenges that, that could use a biological lens on them, some new ideas, some new old ideas. Um, I organized some of these case studies by, uh, by, the, by the segments that you're going to have today during the three days of the conference. So you're going to have a whole section on energy. Um, obviously, if you haven't done this for a while, on your back like your kids, looking up, <laughs> do so. This is the largest energy system on the planet, uh, bar none, photosynthesis, 200 billion tons of carbon fixed um, uh, every year in, in photosynthesis. And yet, our PV cells don't really work like leaves do, not yet. Um, th it's beginning. Um, there's a whole field of, there's a whole um, category of, of thin film solar cells that are called dye-sensitized solar cells, dye, D-Y-E, uh, because chlorophyll is a dye. That's how nature uses a pigment dye to pull down that, that sunlight. Um, and then a series of molecules to move those electrons away. It's, a very, it's very different from, believe it or not, from the silicon solar cells. Um, so that, this has been mimicked now. There's plenty of companies. There's a, there's a thriving industry in, in dye-sensitized solar cells. Interestingly, they work at all times of day. Unlike other solar cells, the silicon solar cells that really work best midday. They work in any orientation. They can be flat, they can be vertical, um, they can be wrapped around a building, for instance. 
It's an interesting, it's an interesting um, uh, technology. But all of those years of photosynthetic research are now going towards this. But what's really on my horizon, the thing that I'm watching, the signal in the literature now, and it's something that um, the US government is very involved in. There's many national laboratories involved in what's called artificial photosynthesis. And the idea here is that a leaf doesn't really just take in solar and pump out electrons. What the leaf actually does is takes in solar, uses that energy to split water, and then uses CO2 to make sugars and starches. So it's actually photons to some sort of a fuel. Um, and that's what people are working on now. They're working on a way to go from um, gather the sunlight, split water. When you split water, you have oxygen that we breathe, but then you also have hydrogen protons. Put two of them together and you have hydrogen gas. That's a storable energy carrier that you can put into a fuel cell, for instance, at night. Or take CO2, put it together, and start to make uh, methanol and other kinds of fuels. And this is, you know, this is this has been maturing now for 10, 15 years. Um, and I, I'm expecting to see um, technologies like this, hybrid solar cells that split water and make fuel or make hydrogen. There's also a lot of work being done on energy storage, nature's batteries. How does an electric eel generate 600 volts of electricity instantly without frying itself? <laughs> Interestingly, the electric eel doesn't have PVC covering its wires. I look at the natural world as existence proof. Sometimes we get into the idea that, you know, we, we can get rid of PVC everywhere else except for wires. We really need it for wires. Amazon Electric Eel. And again, Yale and NIST uh, looking at the first, first technologies out of this will be um, artificial retina, um, energy supplies for artificial retinas using your, own, your body's own biochemicals. Um, but at some point, I'm wondering about this as a battery idea. There's all kinds of ways that nature saves energy, not just produces energy, but saves energy. The natural world is a master of streamlining. Uh, friction is expensive. And all the noise that you hear in the fans and whatnot is friction. It's, it's, uh, it's money out the door as well. But life is really good at reducing that friction. Um, believe it or not, there's a, there's the humpback whale has, has scalloped edges on the leading fin of the humpback whale. And those scalloped edges play with turbulence, again, like the shark, in such a way uh, that allows the whale to, to do its ballet-like ballet feeding. And a, a scientist called Frank Fish um, has mimicked this in, in uh, wind turbines. And also, that's a, that's a model for an airplane wing. When put in a wind tunnel, an airplane wing with scalloped edges reduced drag by 32% and increased lift for the airplane by 8%. I mean, those are enormous, those are enormous numbers. Um, tubercle effect. Water, the next oil, procure, how do we procure it, purify it? distribute it. Um, this is an interesting one. This is a little beetle called the Namibian beetle. Uh, it's a desert beetle that has beautiful but simple but elegant pattern on its wing scales that has water-loving bumps um, next to waxy uh, troughs. And fog water, fog begins to accumulate on the tips of the bumps the balls grow and grow and grow, and then they run down the waxy troughs into the critter's mouth. Very, very simple. People are beginning to make, um, this is MIT, and um, a group called Kinetic. Grimshaw is, the, is an architectural company that's working on this, making sheets 
of water-loving and water-fearing hydrophilic and hydrophobic squares next to each other to be able to capture fog water and move it away. Turns out it works 10 times better than our fog catching nets. So if you can imagine wrapping a building in foggy area like San Francisco with a film like this to gather fog water and, and move it into your building, potable fog water. Um, organ lots of organisms uh, take water from air, either from humidity or from fog. Um, it's the subtle effects that we're beginning to try to mimic. Filtering water. Here is a, a Danish company called Aquaporin that's mimicking these hourglass-shaped pores in lots of cells, but in our red blood cells particularly, that escort water through, leaving everything else on the other side. It's interesting. It's completely different than reverse osmosis for desalination. It's actually forward osmosis. Instead of pushing water against a membrane and having it clog, these pores actually pull water through rather than push. 100 times faster than desalination. Uh, really interesting. And it's ubiquitous. Um, this is Dean Cameron, and this is a, a company called Biolytics, Australian company that's mimicking the soil bank profile. A soil bank by a river filters water in particular ways, and he's mimicking that for a residential uh, septic. 10% of the energy costs of conventional sewerage. This is um, a water mixing device by a company called Pax Scientific. And what it's modeled on it's modeled on the Fibonacci sequence, a spiral form that's found everywhere in the natural world because it is the most friction-free form. It's in seashells and it's in the cochlear of your ear. Uh, it's in your skin pores. There's a three-dimensional sort of staircase that's in this spiral form so that your water vapor, your sweat can escape. And it's the first time that somebody's actually put that form, which is the perfect flow form, onto fans and onto water mixers. This is a little water mixer. It's now in MoMA. Um, it's so beautiful, but it's also really powerful. It's very small, and it sits at the bottom of a million gallon water, municipal water storage tank. And it starts and it runs on something like a, like a 40 watt light bulb would run on, about that much energy. But it mixes the entire thing so that chlorine can be minimized because instead of stratifying, the water layer stratifying, the water is thoroughly mixed and chlorine can reach every molecule. Simple flow device, ubiquitous in the natural world. Materials, there's a huge need for us to rewrite the story of stuff, starting at where we source the stuff. This is an interesting one. Coral reefs don't see CO2 as a poison. Mollusks, anything that's, anything that's hard, any seashell in the ocean, the ingredient is calcium carbonate from the seawater and CO2. So Brent Constance, who studied at UC Berkeley, studied biomineralization. He studied how bones form and he studied how coral reefs form. And, he, and then he learned that cement emits a ton of CO2 for every ton of cement created. And concrete is our largest building material in the world. So this is a big deal, 6 to 8% of all CO2 emissions. Concrete. Cement is the issue. Um, com the company's called Calera. He's mimicking the coral reef recipe. And he's taking CO2 out of smokestacks. This is at Mill Landing in California, which is a coal-fired utility plant. Taking the CO2 out of the smokestack, spraying seawater through it, and out comes carbonates that then, uh, bicarbonates that, that can then be made into a cement um, that does not need to be fired. So it replaces Portland cement. Actually sequesters a half a ton of CO2 for every ton created. So imagine your buildings getting a carbon sequestration credit. This is another one, plastics made out of CO2. 
Plants use CO2 to make starches and sugars. A company called Novomer, the work was done at Cornell, and they're using CO2 and uh, limonene, which is a waste product from citrus um, industry. They're putting those together to make polycarbonates. Um, uh, CDs, sunglasses, really tough plastics out of CO2. 50% of the weight of the plastic is CO2. Biodegradable. It's not sequestered as long as the, the cement is, um, but interesting. Interesting to think about, as life would, CO2 as a building block. God knows we have enough of it. Um, sourcing. We, um, we have been going to oil wells for our plastics, petroleum, for everything from our carpets to probably the clothes I'm wearing, nylon. Um, the new wellhead, as we go towards bio-based products that are based on cornstarch, the new wellhead is soil fertility. Um, that rootlet, <laughs> is the new oil rig, because soil fertility really is a fossil resource. It takes a long, 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 long time to really develop good soil fertility. So that's why it's so, it's so important that we think about new ways to do agriculture, especially as we're moving to biofuels and to bioplastics. Um, Ecosystem-inspired agriculture. Uh, there's lots of work going on um, looking at prairies, looking at mixed species, hundreds of species in a field in a, in a prairie, all perennial. And our agricultural fields now are one species, monoculture, a pest restaurant, all-you-can-eat restaurant, and all annuals that you have to dig up every year and that soil goes down the Mississippi. So moving from an annual monoculture to a perennial polyculture is biomimetic agriculture. And it turns out that it's actually very, very good for biofuel production. Uh, it's better even than going with a monoculture of switchgrass. If you go with a polyculture of prairie grasses, uh, there's actually much more BTU um, that can be harvested. Plus, it's a lot better for the soil and holding that soil fertility is gonna be a huge design challenge for us. Uh, materials that heal themselves. Um, durability is a really interesting thing, and in the natural world, durability uh, is appropriate. There's time degradation that we can learn a lot from. Things break down when they need to break down, not a minute before, um, and they heal. Um, and so we're, there's a lot of, of work uh, there's a wonderful pipe, oil pipe healing technology that actually uh, works like your, like, your blood, uh, like your blood clotting mechanism does to recognize that there's a fissure in the pipe and race uh, materials to that and seal it automatically. Um, energy use, the embedded energy of a material starts at that manufacturing line. And a lot of it is because we use we use a manufacturing process that material scientists call heat, beat, and treat. We heat things up, high temperatures, take oil, petroleum, and heat it up, and you know, Kevlar, for instance, heat it up to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, put it in sulfuric acid, high pressures to pull it out, compared to spiders. That's spider silk, those are spinnerets of a spider. In water, not organic solvents, chemistry. Amazing chemistry in water, body temperature, um, low pressures, five times stronger ounce for ounce than steel. So lots of people, again, US Navy has really um, funded much of the work in spider silk research, looking for a way to make fibers out of common raw materials in benign ways. Strong fibers. Same way with ceramics. A lot of work being done on abalone shell as the model organism. How do you make ceramics? These ceramics are twice as tough as our ceramics, but there's no kiln. How do you self-assemble a hard material uh, in seawater um, or in a beaker? 
Uh, and there's lots of work being done at National Labs on this as well, especially Sandia National Lab. This is Jeff Brinker, who's sort of a godfather of this. Toxin reduction. In the natural world, there's a really interesting dichotomy between our chemistry and the rest of na nature's chemistry. Our chemistry, we use all the elements in the periodic table. And when you look at all of life, all 30 million species, and you look at what they're composed of, it's only a subset of the periodic table. In our chemistry, it's all the elements and really crude recipes, and in the natural world, it's a few elements with really elegant recipes. Terry Collins taught me that. Uh, he's a green chemist at Carnegie Mellon. Um, designing a whole new chemistry based on nature's recipe book is one of those big, bold initiatives that we should be involved in. Um, maybe you don't even need chemistry. Maybe you don't even need a toxin. Antibacterials. 100,000 people a year die, will die in the United States from hospital-acquired infections. More than AIDS, breast cancer, and car collisions combined. Like a, a whole airplane full of people die every year of hospital-acquired infections. So we need a new way to deal with bacteria. And we usually are just upping the antibiotics and we're upping the harsh cleansers. There's a whole bunch of people in biology looking at how nature keeps bacteria from its surface. This again is a shark, but not a fast-moving one. It's a Galapagos shark and has no bacteria on its surface. Um, it has a pattern that's been mimicked by a company called Sharklet Technologies, and this is one you can buy today. You can put these films on railings, um, on hospital beds, on doorknobs, and these films have this pattern on them, and bacteria just don't, do not feel comfortable on that pattern. They can't get a foothold so biofilms don't form. Really important alternative to chemistry. Um, here's a chemistry that is indoor air quality, uh, important in indoor air quality. The glues in plywoods um, have been heavily formaldehyde laden, urea formaldehyde. Um, they need to be waterproof, and so that's what we use, urea formaldehyde. Um, mussels, of course, glue themselves underwater. It's easy for them to glue themselves underwater, um, but it's not so easy for us. It's finally been mimicked. It's a company called Columbia Forest Products. So you can get casework now. You can get um, hardwood cabinets uh, that are glued together. It's a product called Pure Bond with a mimic of this mussel glue. Actually uses soy protein as its major component, but the recipe is from the mussel. Um, this is a company called Interface Carpets that decided to get off glue not use so much glue. They have, they have uh, carpets, you've heard about the carpet tiles, you know, in commercial buildings. I'm sure you, your building probably has carpet tiles. Usually there's glue under every single carpet tile. Um, we did a workshop with them and said, you know, life uses, these geckos use gravity to hold themselves and Van der Waals forces to hold themselves to the ground. It's, very, it's a very small force, um, but, it, but it, gravity helps with that. So if there was a way we could attach all the carpet tiles together, Gravity would hold it down, and indeed that's what's happening. They just use these little, they just sort of put a little coaster-like adhesive thing called a tactile, a little dot of, of uh, reverse uh, two-sided adhesive at the corner of every carpet tile. It becomes a broadloom carpet. 95% reduction in the toxic uh, uh, effect of their product because of that. Very simple ideas. Um, brominated compounds in fire retardants, huge issue coming. Um, there's a company in Sweden that's looked at the Krebs cycle in your own body as you're digesting your breakfast. You're doing something that um, is now being mimicked for a completely, um, it's actually a food grade uh, fire retardant. It's, it's um, you can actually eat it, it's from wineskins. Um, Structural color is another interesting field. Color, pigments are chemically intensive to make. And um, when you buy a black outfit, you're, you should think about the river, the, the river water coming out of the textile plant. Um, yellow, cadmium, 
being used in, in pigments. They're really, they really can be quite toxic. And yet in the natural world, color, the most brilliant colors are not created with pigments. They're created with structure. So this, this peacock is brown, has absolutely no blue in it, no yellow. It has layers that the light bounces through and reflects to your eye a color. Never fades. It's built in to a very common material, keratin, like your fingernails. Very common material. It's how you lay it up. This is a really interesting one. Imagine replacing paints with a permanent thin film that creates color, or a thin film that you can actually separate. When you separate the layers, you get a different color. So you can actually dial different colors. A lot of designers working on this. There's actually a product, this is Qualcomm. On the lower left there, there's a, a display screen that uses the structural color idea. It has each pixel, is, each, each pixel of color is created by these little mirrors, just two little mirrors that either go far apart or close together to create a particular color. Of course, there's no backlighting because the light is actually created by the sunlight coming to your eye. Extremely low power iPad-like device. This is Qualcomm, again, in San Diego. And that's a fabric um, on the left, on the right there, that is um, structural color as well. It has no pigment in it. It's done through structure. A company called Tijin in Japan. Life builds. <laughs> We're not the first to build. Um, and for their size, these little diatom structures, extremely strong. All kinds of buildings are learning from the natural world. I could go, I could go on for days about what's happening in the building field. Um, I'll pull out a couple of things I think are really interesting. This is a software program that minimizes the structure you need in the beams of your building or in any parts of your building. Um, it's based on how trees basically put material where they need to to be stronger in some places while taking it away from others. Your bones do the same thing. In response to stress, your bones put mineral where it's needed and take it away from where it's not needed. Um, those ideas were put in an algorithm, in a mathematical formula, in a software program. There's a company, GM Opal, is, used it to actually create a 40% light-weighted car <laughs> Uh, using, using that software program. This is one that just came out. It's a company called Ornolux. And they looked, you know, 250,000 birds a day in Europe die because of buildings. More birds are killed by buildings than anything else. Um, and so this might be something, and I know LEED is coming out with some bird-friendly building credits. Here's finally a glass, and it's bio-inspired. Spiders have UV reflective uh, elements in their web. And what, they, what they're doing is trying to keep birds from flying through their web. So they're signaling to birds, I'm here. Um, but insects can't see it. They, just, they actually get attracted to it. So, so this was put into uh, a window. We don't see that pattern, but that's what birds see. On the right is what birds see. It's a German, German company. This is another German idea. Um, can a building clean itself? Based on the lotus effect. The lotus effect is um, lotus leaves have certain bumps on their surfaces. And a, you can see it in that, in that SEM there. Um, and what happens is that dirt kind of teeters on those bumps, water balls up, and it pearls off the dirt as it rolls. And that actual architecture has been put into a lot of things. There's a building facade paint called Lotuson paint by Stowe. It's headquartered now in uh, Georgia, um, here in the States. And rainwater cleans the building instead of sandblasting, <laughs> instead of detergents. It's simply the structure as it dries uh, does the same thing that the lotus leaf does. And there's fabrics and glass, self-cleaning glass. Um, our buildings don't really look like trees, um, but they distribute fluids. Our plumbing has corners. Um, this is Kate McCullen, uh, who has found that if we were to put our plumbing into more branched structures, 
um, it would be a far more efficient way to distribute fluids. And when you think of how much energy is used to move fluids, air and water, uh, this, is, this is something we might want to look at. Transport. This is, a, uh, this is a kingfisher. And there was a, uh, a Japanese engineer working on a high-speed train in Japan. Um, those ones that go like 250 kilometers. But they're very loud. When they go into a tunnel, they build up a pressure wave. And exiting the tunnel, there's a sonic boom. So he was charged with quieting that. He was a birder. Again, research, biological research. Um, this is what the train looks like now. And it uses 15% less electricity, goes 10% faster, and it's quiet. Volvo studied locusts and how they avoid collisions. Um, as, as a material saving device, I put this in. Besides the fact that it saves lives, it also saves materials in the 600,000 cars you have in the US fleet. Uh, it's, right, it's right now the software program. Again, it's a software program. Um, this, is a new, this is a new way of looking at um, having ships move very, very quickly through water by encasing them literally in a layer of air, which is what the water fern does. And there's a group in Germany, again, creating a thin film to wrap around ships. This is an example of transport optimization, routing optimization. This is a critter called a slime mold. And when it goes out to find food and distribute food, it creates nearly perfect optimal paths. Um, and again, mathematicians have taken that information of how they do it um, and are sharing it with people who build roads to find the optimum way to get from one point to another. IT and electronics is part of your, part of your uh, symposium. Lots going on here. Here's an energy saving thing that uses IT. Um, swarm technology. Bees, ants, social insects are being studied for their amazing abilities to find your picnic <laughs> and get to it, right, in, in instant. Um, and tell everybody else about it at the hive, right? How does that happen? Well, people study these things. They win Golden Fleece Awards for studying these things. Um, but um, there's a company called Regen en Energy that has taken the ant colony optimization programs and put it into a system that is going to be really important for the smart grid. It actually, um, it actually has appliances talking to one another, similar to how bees forage together and tell each other about resources, so that they can decide to shut down during peak power loads. Um, and I can see this happening. They, they've got systems that work on a neighborhood network. Uh, and as more and more of smarter planet, IBM smarter planet kind of things come to cities as we come to e-governance, I can see this sort of thing being, being more important, um, and, and including to the smart grid. So there will be bugs in the smart grid, and it'll be OK. There's a guy named Craig Tovey at Georgia Tech who also studies honeybees. He's looking at increasing server allocation um, for, this is for data servers, increasing efficiency by 25% by using honeybee algorithms. MIT, M there's lots of bio-inspired engineering going on right now at MIT. I just learned that the head of MIT is a biologist, a new biologist, so I'm not surprised. This is a, a, a new computer chip, very, very low power. It pulls in radio waves, internet, and TV and it's completely modeled on the cochlear of your ear. Super, super low power. At the ecosystem level, I've been talking about little individual um, devices. At the ecosystem level, biomimicry is, um, is looking at cities. Um, we're working with a company called HOK, the largest architecture firm in the world. Um, and we're asking ourselves, um, can a city provide ecosystem services? So not just take care of its own needs, but actually filter water, purify air, 
give back in the same way as this is Man Manhattan, this is what Manhattan looked like. We expect ecosystem services from the one on the right. Could the one on the left also give us ecosystem services? That's the question. So ecological performance standard is something that we're working on. What we'd love to do is look at all biomes in the United States, come up with ecosystem services from intact native ecosystems, and challenge the cities to match that. You imagine, that's, that's a maturing of our species, I think. So we look at things like water collection and storage. How many gallons are collected and stored in a storm? The city has to do the same thing. The buildings, the hardscapes, the softscapes has to create the same level of ecosystem services or exceed it. So it's a new level of metrics, water filtration, evapotranspiration, soil building, and it's local and it's based on, it's informed by that local uh, ecosystem. Um, often when I talk about biomimicry like this, you get the impression that somebody else is working on it. But actually, as I said, it's become very much a in real time sort of, um, sort of process. So let me give you some resources before I leave. Um, inviting a biologist to your design table, whether it's um, a local biologist, somebody from Natural History Museum near you, um, contact us and we can put you in touch with, with biologists. Um, knowing that not everybody could hire a biologist, we wanted to put biological information in your hands, in the, in the hands of the people who are designing things every day. Um, and we started something called asknature.org, which is it's kind of a Google-esque thing where we're gathering all biological information by func and organizing it by function. So you can type in, uh, you can type in a, um, uh, something like anti-reflective, and up will come strategies, for instance, about the moth. And we're coordinating this with E.O. Wilson of um, Encyclopedia of Life. So the scientists that are putting, putting data into a web page for every species on Earth, that data will show up on our site, but our site's designed for the design professions. And they don't go to the Encyclopedia of Life, but they go here to find ideas. So we're, it's kind of an innovation matchmaking uh, device. Um, and like EOL, we're hoping it'll grow um, infinitely. It's, a, it's an open source kind of a site that people can contribute to. So check that out. Um, also know that this is that life's ideas can help not just in things, not just in technologies, but in frameworks and in approaches and in ways to think. Because if you look, if you begin to look at what life has in common, that's even more interesting in some ways than these individual, the beetle bumps are cool, but if you say to yourself, what do all organisms on Earth have in common? You come up with a set of life's principles. And these have been used, and companies have really, this has been very interesting to watch companies begin to look at life's principles. These are like the top six, uh, and we do it from a scientific basis and, and sort of teach teach this, it becomes a systemic framework. Um, Marie Zanowick is a, is a woman who's come to a lot of our classes. She works at EPA. She's actually working, she went to a two-year certificate course that we offer, a master's level course. And her project was to try to get life's principles embedded into EPA policy. Some companies are saying, let's meet all of life's principles, and they use it as a design checklist for their company. It's kind of a biological bill of rights. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. <laughs> Life is resilient. Life does chemistry in water. You know, and, and trying to meet, again, nature as measure, trying to meet those standards, um, it's challenging. We need stretch goals. We need aspirate, we need, this is no time to be timid. Smart people tell us that we have less than a decade to prevent irreversible changes on planet Earth. This is no time to be timid. It's time to be bold. We know how to be bold. We invented national parks, democracy. We know how to be bold if we think about sustainability as a big, big idea. The most innovative design that I can tell you about today 
is the metric of success that life uses. It's very, very, very simple. These organisms have to keep themselves alive. They have to keep their offspring alive. 10,000 generations from now, they have to keep their offspring alive, which is really tough. So what they've done is that they've learned as a system, a sustainable system, how to filter air, how to fertilize the soil every time they eat and excrete, how to build soil, how to clean water, how to pollinate, how to create conditions conducive to life in everything they do. Theirs is a green culture because the metric of success is, does it create conditions conducive to life? Because I can't take care of my offspring 10,000 generations from now. All I can do is take care of the place that's going to take care of my offspring. And that's what you're involved in. That's what you're doing. Don't forget who we are. Everybody asks me, well, you've talked about all these great natural, these organisms. Certainly, you know, they've got this sort of virtue innately within them to do. No, no, we are, we're all biological beings. And we're amazing. We're ama Look at us. We're amazing beings. You know, we really, really are. But we're young. We're incredibly young. But we are nature. So remember that. And we are at the point where our, the hair's on the back of our necks and we're, we've got 10 years, right? We're young. All these critters I've been telling you about, some of them are 3.8 billion years old and we're 200,000 years old. So we're toddlers with matches, yes. <laughs> but we can do wise, mature, sweeping, grand gestures. We know how to do that. And because we're young, it helps that we get some help. Every building is this to me. It's an artifact. It's a natural artifact. We made it. It's natural. It's just like a bird's nest. And what we're trying to do is figure out how to make the bird's nest in such a way that the chicks will fare well here. It's very, very, very simple from a biological standpoint. So that we can do what Stephen Chu was talking about and stay home on this planet. That I think we really want to stay home on. So I wish for you on this conference um, that you remember that you're not alone, that there are 30 million species waiting to gift you with their ideas. And more than that, that you find your own flock mates here. Um, because that's the most important, the most important technology you'll take away from this three days um, is the ability to call somebody up that you've looked in their eyes and you've, you've both decided that you're both committed to this. Um, and that now you're a network, now you're a flock. And biology tells us it's easier to fly in a flock, less friction. So I wish you great good luck. Um, and if you wanna, if you wanna know more about how nature can can uh, help and guide you, please please give us a call. And I'll be watching you, and hopefully comparing myself to you. Thank you so much.